um, basically, you know, we spent a little time um, on some relativistic views. Uh, and, um, you know, tried to show you some of the pros and cons. Um, but with, with the view that we're going to look at next week, we sort of begin some non-relativistic views of ethics. Um, you know, uh, some views that try to say, well, we can talk and reason about ethical issues, um, you know, notwithstanding what the subjectivists say. Uh, and, and also we can talk about some non-relative universal moral standards that hold across culture. Um, and the first view we're going to look at next time uh, is a view that some people don't even think is an ethical view, but it really is. Uh, it, it's called ethical egoism. Um, and it basically is the view that the moral thing the right thing for us to do is to do what promotes our own best interest. In other words, that looking out for number one, uh, number one being ourselves, is the chief goal of morality. Uh, now, obviously, not everyone thinks this. In fact, many people think that Sometimes it is the antithesis of morality that, that um, you know, and, and we saw in that first chapter, Rachel says we have to have a certain amount of impartiality when we uh, look at an ethical issue, that we um, want to look at things um, and as if we were an objective observer and, and choose the right course of action simply based on what is right and not based on what's going to help us or be in our best interest. Um, but of course, this view of ethics, ethical agilism, um, if it's correct, we can't do that because it says that morality itself is basically following what's in my best interest. Um, now, this is obviously not a psychology course. And even though philosophers, the first psychologists were philosophers, and philosophers often get confused with psychologists, I guarantee you that happens. But, um, but we do have a psychological view here in Chapter 5. And you might say, why is that in there? I thought this was an ethics course, that we were looking at ethical theories and different perspectives on ethics. Um, what is this, you know, psychological egoism in there? Well, basically, it's a view that tries to give us a picture of human, uh, uh, of how humans are made. And it's not, um, it's not a modern psychological theory. Um, this view in its basis was discussed as far back as Plato, in Plato's, uh, Republic, um, when, you know, it's one view that is considered and rejected, but nonetheless, it's considered. Um, and there's a, a rather strange story connected with it. I can remember way back in the 80s, uh, I was teaching a course, an intro course, but also covering some ethics, and and I was on the mailing list of some publishers, and I got an exam, a teacher's examination, a copy of an ethics text, 
And it had this story from Plato in it about Rainbow Gibbon, P-Y-T-E-F. And I thought, you know what, this is very strange. Um, now, Rachel does not go into that story, but I'm just going to lay the basics because it's often read uh, or, or it's often included in ethics texts. Um, to illustrate this view of psychological language. Um, basically, Gidges is a shepherd, and he's one of the king's shepherds. And the view that's argued there is that we're all selfish, and we all would act uh, in utterly selfish ways if we thought we could always get away with it. And the only thing that keeps us from acting in utterly selfish ways are societal constraints. Uh, that, that some of our behavior would be illegal uh, and we suffer um, you know, consequences. But but the point of this strange story about the ring of Gibbon is to illustrate what would happen if there were no consequences for our actions. Um, so it tells the story of this king shepherd Gibbon is in the field and there's a huge thunderstorm. And maybe also an earthquake and the ground opens up. And there's this weird um, room with a figure, the body of a figure that um, Gidget says is, was obviously more than just a normal human being. So Gidget goes down there, and there are all kinds of some things um, surrounding this, this body. Um, but what he just focuses on is a ring that the figure has. And he takes this ring off and he surfaces. And this sounds like a, a, a story out of a sword and sorcery movie when, when you really read it. Because um, he goes back to join his fellow shepherds and He's kind of messing around with the ring while they're sitting around the fire talking. And then he turns the ring inside out, and all of a sudden, his fellow shepherds are acting like he's not even there. And then he turns it the other way, and then they relate to him. And he experiments with this, and he learns that he has a magic ring that will make him invisible at will, depending on how he turns it. And so, realizing this, um, that if some of you are in the business world, you know, you have to do reports for your boss, uh, how are things going? Well, the shepherd had to send a report back to the king on how well the flocks were going. And so he is knowing what he now has, uh, decides to, he finagles his way into being one of the messengers that takes the report of how the king's flock is doing back to the king. But then using the powers of the magic ring, he uh, seduces the queen. He uh, kills the king, takes over half of the kingdom. Um, and you can say, well, this was a really evil guy. Um, you know, here's somebody who did all these things 
Uh, but that's not the moral of this little story. See, the moral of this little story is, uh, as the character uh, goes on to explain, if you had two people, somebody who was a scoundrel and had a reputation for being, uh, uh, you know, shady and who acts immorally. And, and then you take uh, another person who has a reputation for being an honest, upstanding, you know, very moral person. And the character in the dialogue says, you know what, if we gave one of these magic rings to both of them, he says, if somebody had this power and, and, and there were no consequences for their actions because they could make themselves invisible at will, then he says, who would have enough strength of character that they would resist going into the marketplace and taking anything they wanted and, and going and seducing, uh, you know, uh, neighbor's wives. Uh. In, in other words, the story, the character in the story says, it's not that Jesus was an unusually evil guy. Um, the view there is that we would all act that way if there weren't any external restraints to our actions. Uh, and, and this gets out this theory of psychological egoism that basically the way we're constructed as human beings is that the only thing that really motivates us to do anything is if we see something in it for us. That the only thing that motivates us is self-interest. And, and that, at rock bottom, is psychological um, egoism. Um, but now, now there's a story about Lincoln a little bit later, and of course Lincoln was the person who said he can some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time but you can't fool all the people all the time right um, well there's a, a kind of parallel point I like to draw about psychological egoism and if I had a video to capture I'd put it on the board but in order to understand this view and, and what you're going to what you've read about it or what you will read about it. Um, a lot of us know people who we think, you know, that's a really selfish person. You know, Mary acts really selfishly a lot. Um, you know, she could always out for herself. Um, and and, 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 you know, so some of us know people who would say, you know, this person acts selfishly all the time. Um, and most of us, if we're honest, we would say, well, you know what, there, there might be times when I thought that I was uh, doing something for somebody else, but when I really thought about it, I realized that I was only acting in my own self-interest for what I could get out of it. In other words, most of us might say, you know, there are some times when I act selfishly, right? Well, in order to understand this view of psychological egoism, we need to understand that it's a very extreme sort of view of human nature it's not the view that there are just are some people out there, like Mary, who act selfishly all the time. It isn't the view that some people act selfishly all the time. And it isn't the view that we all act selfishly some of the time. 
like most of us would admit, you know, they say, well, you know, hey, I, I, I kind of fooled people. People thought I, that what I did was really nice, but I really did for myself. Um, neither one of those views is this extreme view of psychological egoism. But basically, psychological egoism says we all act selfishly all the time. In other words, that the only thing that motivates us is acting in our own interest, promoting our own self-interest. Um, now, if we define altruism as the, the view that would put the interests of somebody else above our interests, the point raised by this um, view is whether altru genuinely altruistic behavior is possible at all. Uh, now we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so, so that psychological egoism and um, I, I'm going to go through some of these slides uh, real, real quick. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I I don't think I made this these up. Actually, these were originally part of a. But so, so psychological egoism is not itself an ethical theory. Okay? Ethical egoism is. But psychological egoism is a very old psychological theory about human motives, about what makes us tick as human beings. Right? And it holds basically, uh, as I've already said, that the only thing that motivates us to do anything is if we see something in it for ourselves. That is, that human beings are motivated to action only through self-interest. Um, and of course, the last point is the point I've already made, that it's not itself an ethical theory. Now, um, what you see in, in, in this um, slide is an argument that your text uh, discusses on pages 67 and 68. Um, and pointing out this feature is one way that people try to defend the view of psychological egoism. So uh, you can kind of see this view. I call it in the slide here, it's main supporting argument. That's the way it was discussed in the text that I originally um, got up the presentation um, as a reference. I think it's the business. We always do what we want, but our wants are, after all, our wants. So, if we're always doing what we want, then, uh, you know, our wants, since they are our wants and desires, then our wants are always selfish. Therefore, we always act selfishly if we're always doing what we want. Um, and as I say, um, what this is is a rational argument of trying to convince somebody that this theory is a legitimate theory. And, and you know, most of the time I don't have to convince students of this. But now, th th there are some replies. One is that we don't always 
do what we want. And this point is made in your text. Um, you know, that, that often we might act uh, out of duty contrary to our wants, just because we might think that we have a particular ethical duty, either to keep a promise or, you know, to be benevolent to someone. Uh, and so, so one reply to this is, is that uh, we don't always act according to our wants. And if we act from an obligation against our wants, then, then that seems to pose some problems for this claim that we're always acting selfish. Um, now, even if our wants or our desires are really our wants, that is, they reflect what we genuinely desire, it does not follow from this that all our wants are selfish. Um, what we want or desire uh, might be something like another's welfare or another's good. This point was made about 200 years ago um, by a, a bishop, I think it was a Protestant bishop, uh, whose last name was Butler, and he, he wrote um, at length against this view of psychological egoism. Um, but, but I mean, other, you know, other people in the Christian tradition, though, have thought, well, you know, this, uh, this kind of, this theory sort of reflects uh, uh, the way a lot of people actually are. Um, but the question is, can we act altruistic? And Butler tried to defend it. And what Butler said is, uh, if you're trying to decide whether a one or a desire we have is selfish, you don't look at the fact that it's one of your own desires, one of your own wants. Um, that's not what determines whether it's selfish or unselfish. But um, what, what Bishop Butler's point is, is uh, if I say I want X or I desire X, here um, X represents the object of my want or desire. Pardon? I mean, basically, if I say I desire X, um, X is, is the object of my desire. I desire an A in the course. I desire a piece of chocolate cake, you know. Um, I, I, I desire... Um, Well, the, basically, what Bishop Butler's point is, and, and this is made in your text without crediting him for the point, uh, is that what determines whether a want or a desire is selfish or unselfish, uh, the way we find that out is to look at the object of the want, not the fact that it's my desire. So if the object of my want is the good of another person, then it's hard to see that want as a selfish one.
and, and this is made uh, kind of three-fourths of the way down page 68. The mere fact that you act on your own desires, for one, does not mean that you are looking out for yourself. It all depends on what you desire. If you care only about yourself and give no thought to others, then you are acting out of self-interest. But if you want other people, say, to be happy, and you act on that desire, um, then you aren't acting self-interest. In other words, if, if your desire is directed toward the good of another person, then um, Bishop Butler said, well, well, that type of desire or want is not a, a selfish or self-interested desire. So he said, uh, just because our wants are ours, uh, it doesn't follow from that that they're necessarily um, selfish. Now, in order to understand why this is a consequence of this view, again, you have to uh, go back to what I said, that this is not the view that some people act selfishly all the time. It's not the view that we all act selfishly some of the time. But it's the view that we all act selfishly all the time, and that that's the only way we can act as human beings, so that's just the way we're put together. Um, well, if that's true, and again, when the altruistic motive is a motive that puts the interests of somebody else above our own, well, if the only way we can act is from self-interested motives, then it seems to be a logical consequence of this view that we can't uh, ever do anything from a genuinely altruistic motive. But, but you say, well, wait a second, I mean, people do things all the time for, you know, other people is good, you know. Uh, they donate, you know, um, money to charity, you know, they save sales, you know, parents, um, you know, sacrifice for their children. Um, you know, you have people like Mother Teresa out there doing good deeds. Um, and we had D. Gaddy uh, in Baltimore. She died, but, but she, uh, you know, had, had this thing where, where uh, uh, it was a sort of ministry to people who were down and out or homeless. And doing altruistic things all the time. Um, what about this? Well, this Lincoln story is an example of how psychological egoists respond to the claim that there seem to be examples of altruistic behavior out there. Um, in other words, why don't we take them as falsifying the view that we're always acting selfish? As, as counterexamples that prove psychological ideas are false. Well, the problem is you can always reinterpret people's motives. In other words, the psychological egoist can say, well, no matter what your motive seems to be, my theory says your motive can't be a self-interested motive. 
So no matter what it seems to be, your real motive must have been a selfish one, not an altruistic one. Pardon? Um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not familiar with the term. In other words, wanting to feel good is, uh, you know, a sort of self-interested thing, right? And so, so Lincoln is reinterpreting his motive as a self-interested one. Um, <laughs> and so, so if we help an old lady across the street, maybe we do it. Uh, for some other motive. And, and, and basically, this strategy of reinterpreting motive can be done, and this is one reason why it makes it 
hard to give counterexamples to this view because um, you can always take any benefit that we might get from doing something, even if, even if it's only a psychological benefit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to feel bad this afternoon that it didn't help out with the school text, right? Uh, very often feeling of satisfaction. Um, well, we can always say, or, or and, and this gets back to your, your comment about what, what was that thing to you? Confirmation bias, right? In, in other words, the, these people are saying, well, look, if, if there was any benefit that you received out of it, I, as a psychological analyst, am going to tell you that your real motive, no matter what you think you're your real motive was to act to receive that benefit, hence a, to act from a self-interested motive. So if any benefit comes to us from doing something, uh, the, you know, the agilist, the psychological agilist can always say, well, that was why. You did it to receive that particular benefit. And so, And, and, you know, so even if it were in hand, like Lincoln, right, Lincoln says, well, well, okay, there wasn't the tangible benefit, but there was the intangible psychological benefit that I wouldn't feel bad the rest of the day, that I wouldn't help them. Um, often, I mean, if, if you helped a little old lady across the street and got a feeling of satisfaction, or you give the guy standing with the cardboard sign on the street corner, five bucks, you know, uh, and, 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 and you feel good about it, then, um, you know, then, then you can say, well, um, that was my motive. Or, or the agilist could say that's your motive, to receive that satisfaction. Um, but this makes uh, the point, um, you can say, well, this really begs the question. In other words, it assumes what should be proven by the agorist. Uh, it begs the question in favor of psychological agorism because it always assumes that our real motive is always the selfish motive. You know, uh, in other words, that's the length they have to go to to defend the theory. And why must we assume this? And also, as Karl Popper uh, once pointed out, um, if there doesn't seem to be a way that a theory can be falsified, in other words, if, a, if any possible counterexample turns out to be one that the theory can incorporate, then it may not be a scientific or an empirical theory after all, but may just be held on to um, you know, in, spite, in spite of um, what the evidence requires. Um, now, see if you can understand this uh, illustration. John Stuart Mill, we're, we're going to see, um, did think we could act altruistically. He was one of the founders of a theory that we're going to spend quite a bit of time on later, the co-parenting with you, that, that um, we are to act to promote the greatest good the greatest number of people. And, and that may uh, require acting against ourselves. That may not be what, what's in our self-interest in given situations. It may not be what's best for all concerned. Um, so Mill did not like psychological agorism. And in, in Mill's day, in the 19th century, uh, how did they find the type? I remember he said, look, my strategy was not to look for the time plan, but to understand that if the ship really broke up, there was going to be a 
So, uh, if we receive a benefit from something we do, it does not follow that what motivated us to do it was to receive that particular benefit, even if it's only like the feeling of satisfaction. Um, and, and here is a little deeper point. It's not really made in the text. Butler made it and other people who discussed this. Think about it. I mean, take something like um, what you get. Um, and, and 
And you just and, and, and when you think about it, there are a lot of people who in Lincoln's situation wouldn't be bothered one bit if they saw uh, the Sal and the cigarettes in trouble. And why? Because they really don't care very much for them. Like, okay, you know, this and that. Right, but but no, I mean, in, in other words, somebody could argue against Lincoln that um, that the fact, the reason he would feel bad if he didn't help them was because he genuinely cared for their good, you know, uh, and and that he didn't act from such a self. Selfish mode is possible. Uh, in other words, that somebody who didn't really care for the good of those kids and piglets, um, that person is not going to feel bad for them. Whereas Lincoln would have felt bad. Why? Because he genuinely cared for those animals, you know. Um, and, and so maybe his motive wasn't as uh, self interested as he thought. Well, so these are the kinds of things that are usually discussed, um, you know, but, but most people, um, and even Socrates and Plato thought that we could rise above, uh, you know, um, our tendency to just want to help ourselves and, you know, um, <coughs> do things <coughs> just on principle or just because they're right. Um, well, this is the point that I made a little earlier, that it's not a strength of a theory that no possible empirical observation seems to falsify it. Um, in other words, one of the things you call that is, uh, if you want to really test the theory, try to figure out what would prove it false, and go out and try to prove it false rather than to prove it true. He says, if you talk about pseudoscience and people who have false pseudoscientific theories, um, Popper says, look, they see confirmation of their views around every street corner. Um, and now he, he's a really marvelous he is a story in psychology and he is a Marxist in example. He say, in tender of a Marxist point of view, he sees confirmation of his views on class struggle, struggle on exploitation, everything. You know, but Popper said, the, the real strength of a real scientific theory is what events in the world would have to happen that would prove this theory is false. I mean, if I had a theory that, well, well we have this theory, these theories about these, uh, this comic. You know, somebody says it's going to be a, one of the brightest objects in the sky. You know, now people are thinking this thing might be breaking up in the sun and it's not going to be. Um, well, you could tell a story about what would confirm or deny it. I mean, um, is there water on Mars? Well, we could tell stories about how we could confirm or disconfirm that. Um, so, so what Popper said is, if, if no possible observation seems to falsify a theory, that may show that it's just a piece of pseudoscience um, and, and not a really empirically testable theory. That, that is a, a testable theory by observation and method and really studying scientific method and, and maybe should be rejected as a piece of pseudoscience held on to in spite of any possible evidence. Um, you know, 
and 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 this is uh, you know a lot of people's suspicion about psychological egoism that it's, it's uh, held on to uh, by its proponents um, and they'll accept no possible counter to this proven theory. But that's not a good theory. Um, and there are some examples that you really have to go a long way to think of them as selfish. Um, th there was somebody who recently was given the Medal of Honor uh, posthumously. He's up in one of these Humvees or half tracks by, you know, look out by the team down. Three of his buddies are inside and there's a, like an open door. And as they go by, um, a sort of, I guess, Afghan, or just like, throws a hand grenade into the country. And so his buddies are just kind of frozen with fear and a sort of coward way. And, and he knows that this hand grenade goes off and can kill all three of them. He's the only one of the four who's in a position to save himself, but he's up there. He's not trapped down in the, you know, driver's you know, compartment of that vehicle. And what does he do? Well, he jumps down into the vehicle while his buddies are sort of cowering and jumps on top of the camera and he gives up his own life. Um, well, you could say, well, he really did it because he was hoping to, you know, be honored as a hero. But, you know, it's a I mean, it's a possible way of reinterpreting his motives. But most people who do heroic acts like that say the last thing I was thinking about was getting some kind of a reward for what I did. I was just thinking of what I needed to do to get the job done. So at any rate, um, an action like that is very, you have to really go pretty far to interpret that as a selfish act. Um, well, and we're, we're not going to get into this, but, but one of the things that allows the psychological language, of course, to go on and maintain the theory is that motives aren't open to public observation, you know, and because of that, uh, you know, it is a theory that can be held on to by its advocates. Um, so we'll look at ethical egoism, but uh, it, it's in the slide, and if it's the next slide, I'll mention it, if it's not, yeah. This is why we relate this to, and, and this is the last point we made. Um, there's a cliche that says art implies can. In other words, it can't be our moral duty to do what's impossible, to do the impossible. So if there's something I ought to do, it better also be something I can do. Right. Um, well, if odd implies a can, remember, psychological egoism says the only thing I can do, depends on the way human beings are put together, is act from self-interested motive, from selfish motive. So if that's, if psychological egoism is right, and that's the only thing I can do, well, why shouldn't that be the only thing I ought to do? So why shouldn't morality simply be pursuing my own self-interest? You know? and, and ethical egoism is, uh, as we'll see next time, a moral theory that says 
small thing for me to do all those years to pursue my own self-interest. Now, it's not subjective. It's not the theory that however I interpret right and wrong, um, you know, is, is, is okay for me, and if you interpret it differently, that's okay for you. This is a theory that claims to give us the truth about morality. And the truth about morality, the non-relative truth, is that the moral thing to do is to act in the But this is why we look at this view of psychological egoism, because if it's true, and the only thing we can do is act in our own self-interest, then why shouldn't that be the only thing our moral is required to do? And why shouldn't we then accept the ethical theory, ethical egoism, on the premise that psychological egoism is true and we can't act in other ways anyway? So, <laughs> you know. So that's how the two of them get connected together. The psychological theory is given as a view to hold the ethical um, so we'll look at that next time. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for staying. I'm sure it must have been a long day.